What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the show. Today, I am thrilled to have Marcia Reiner, CEO of Trajectory Consulting, joining me today on the show. She's a powerful visionary and author of two books with a third coming out soon. She's also a speaker and the host of the Profit with a Plan podcast. In her work, she helps businesses increase their revenue, take more, take home more profit, and grow the value of the business that would lead to an eventual exit. With proven growth strategies and revenue strategies, Marcia guides her clients through step-by-step success models to help them get results fast. In fact, she even will show her prospective clients exactly how to get a clear ROI from their working together before they ever decide to hire her firm. Marcia, welcome to the MindShift Podcast. Wow, what an intro. Thanks so much, Daryl. I love it. You know, I, it was it was just right on point. Awesome. Um, I, I, I do my research. I do my research, try to figure <laughs> out a few things, you know. So, Marcia, when did you first get started as an entrepreneur? <laughs> you know, I'll go back and give you the when I was three in the, in the, in the lemonade <laughs> stand, but that's not, you know, that's not really what it is. But it was always something, right? Both of my parents were were entrepreneurs, and you know there was always just some sort of a draw. Call me, call me that kid that would get in trouble, and and because they were always trying something, not trying to get in trouble, but trying to be outside the box. And so corporate life just never worked for me. You know, I tried it several times. I tried to conform, and it just didn't work. It didn't work. So um, I officially left corporate life, probably for the fifth or sixth time uh, in the end of 2016 due to a life change and, and divorce and launched uh, Trajectory Consulting and never looked back. You know, I, I uh, left the financial services world, which was very constraining. And I felt like this elephant came off of me and I went, ah, I can breathe again. <laughs> that wow. was great. That's amazing. So what would you say has been when you made the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship, what was the biggest challenge you had as an entrepreneur when you first got started? You know, I'm going to tell you something really strange. Um, I have so much knowledge and skill set and ideas that are just bursting at the seams. And my biggest challenge was reining myself in to do the one thing or the one lane that I'm supposed to be in. Because when you're super creative and visionary and you've spent, gosh, close to $200,000 on, you know, coaching and consulting for my own practice and education and degrees and certifications, you got a lot of ideas facing you. And I had to really ring myself in and go, what's the biggest impact that I can help with and 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 really to focus and stay in that lane instead of being everything to everybody and trying to solve all the world problems which means that you really can't solve any how did you narrow in on the entrepreneurial journey that would lead to where you are today with your growth consulting so funny, it all kind of came in. Um, I, I briefly mentioned that um, I came out of the financial services world. Uh, every every job I've ever had has involved money, from being a bank teller when I got out of school to dealing cards in Reno, um, you know, mortgage business, financial services, and and you know, so it's always had that money theme around it. And when I was the last several years of my financial advising career as a financial planner, I would sit down with my business owner clients and ask them the questions to help them plan for their future. And it was always great. You run a business, you tell me you want to sell the business. What's it worth? Their answer is, uh, or they give me the, uh, the, the shark take answer of some ridiculous number. And I'm like, great. What are you going to do to ensure that that value will be there when it's time to retire? And another kind of deadpan look, uh, you know, and so it, it was really the shift for me. It was kind of my aha 
that because my plans were going to fail with those clients, because they really truly didn't have a solid plan, that I started sharing what I was learning from my coaches. Hey, have you tried this? Have you thought of that? Oh, this would be a great idea. And due to my mom getting sick and the marriage failing, I decided it was time to kind of cut the cords and go out on my own. And that was the area that just felt right. Helping business owners to achieve a business that they could provide for their family with no worries, right? They'd have a legacy later on because they have to sell it. And in order to sell it, your business has to be set up properly, not just corporate structure, but in a way to be attractive to future buyers. Then, along with the investing assets and the real estate and the other holdings they had, they had a business, you know, that turned into a business asset. And yeah. and that's really what I what I kind of narrowed and twiddled down to and, and became what I became evolved into what I've become now. Such a big distinction, uh, having a business that turns into a business asset. And it's interesting. One of my advisors says, and he's, I, I, it rings in my ear every time I think about the idea of um, growing, scaling, and systematizing. And that is the business, you should build a business that's saleable, whether you sell it or not. 100%. And, and his point is, the business should be at a place where it's structured, it has team, it has systems, it has good management and leadership. And if you never decide to sell it, that's fine, but it'll be much more valuable to you, if you even if you don't sell it, and it'll be valuable to someone else. And um, so I love the distinction there. Speaking of which, let's talk about that. So in your work, you help people grow the value of their company so that they can eventually get to a place of exit. And a few moments ago, you know, you indicated that there are ways that some of us are running businesses where they are not sellable. So what are some of the key principles that you help instill or systems or frameworks? What is it, what does it look like when you come in and the company is not saleable and what has to happen so that you can get it to be saleable where their value has increased? Well, I'm going to slip something in just before I answer that question. Okay. There's a reason you want to have it saleable. Because after all, you've invested your blood, sweat, tears, nights, weekends, savings, paychecks, stressful nights, missed games, missed opportunities into Keep this going. business. Why not? Keep going. <laughs> Why Keep going. Tell, tell the people that think it's something else. Keep going. <laughs> Why not get a return on that investment? And if you think about it, you've invested 30 years into your business, you're probably not going to get 30 years of that back, but you better get more than, than one year or two years out of that. So mm. that's why. So good. But um, to go back to your question there, which is really good, there's a difference between your business today, right? If you have the worst boss and the worst horrible employee ever, and they're never getting things done and you're always worrying about them. You're the boss and you're the employee, right? And you've got this company that you're always worrying about. If you're running a business like that, you have a J-O-B. Not, not a very attractive one and it sure as heck doesn't pay very well. But if you run your business like a big business, right? A big corporate structure and you have people and processes and and planning and you've got actionable items and, and and tools in place then it starts to become easier right we got in our business because we knew a jam right we had a gig we understood something really well and oftentimes we mistakenly wrap a business around it or purposefully wrap a business around it without the real skill set of what it takes to run a business. We think we just get in there and swing the hammer. Everything's a nail. This is the hammer. Let's go. There's a lot more to running a business than most young or, or even experienced business owners have. And so some of the strategies that I use 
they're not rocket science. I mean, they're not newfangled things. I'm not recreating a wheel here. I'm just taking the business owner from a point of being scattered and chasing customers and putting out fires to a business owner that is focused and they have clear initiatives that are moving the business forward in a way that they couldn't have found or seen on their own. And mm -hmm. so we're just working that in, in a way to um, that does results. It provides mm -hmm. results, which is kind of a, 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 a thing that's not always occurred in the co coaching and consulting business is actually getting results. Right. But um, <laughs> I get results. I really, truly get results that affect the bottom line and the top line. So. So Marcia, my question I would have for you is we think about these things that you're finding while you say they're not rocket science, I would argue that you're simplifying it a little bit because you and I both know they aren't rocket science to those of us like me and you who've been through the ups, the downs, the failures, the learnings, the coaching, the $200,000 of investment. <laughs> but when the business owners, and I know in my world, when, when the entrepreneurs, business owners, founders, CEOs, and executives are in the middle of their picture, they can't see the frame. So let's 100%. talk about a couple of those things, those items, those areas, those key drivers that yeah. you tend to see most often that they can't see that you, you know, kind of say, well, it's just, it's, you know, it's common. No, it's not common sense. No, no, no. They're, it, they, they're not common sense, but they're not like, oh my gosh, I've never heard of this before. It's just that they, they haven't, they don't have the bandwidth to think about it in that way. Right, they don't look right. at it from this angle or that angle to go, have you thought of this? Yeah. So one of the first areas I always look at with a client is, is the revenue and what's driving it. And if you think about it, there could be, out of my 50 strategies, there could be 47 of them that are all revenue boosters and three of them that are expense cutters, right? And so I love to look at those three or, or a few of those expense cutters right off the get-go to see if we can lean out the company a little bit. A common place for a business owner with a, an accounting um, partner, we'll call it an out external accountant or bookkeeper or tax person that comes in, they're always looking backwards on the company. And rarely, rarely, not all, rarely are they looking forward more than 12 months. Right. And so I like to look at the the company's P&L statement and, and dig in and say, what have you got for your expenses that, that maybe you don't need, right? That could be because your tax accountant is looking to cut your costs or cut your taxes at every opportunity. Therefore, they're trying to run your lifestyle through your business. Good and bad, we all do it. We all run our cell phone and our car payment and some insurances and you know a few things here. But then when you start getting creative and you hire your kid to lick stamps, you know, or you start to run um, that 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 month long trip, you know, and call it business when it was a vacation for the most part through your company, it affects the bottom line. Yeah. And so. The question I like my clients to ask themselves, and we do an audit, and this is where you print out all your, your, your credit card receipts or, or we look through your QuickBooks and, and we go through and we ask these three questions to every single expense. Does it produce a new customer? Does it retain a customer? Or does it improve the lifetime value of a customer? If it doesn't, probably want to redline that that expense, right? And right. and you know, or run it through your business, but adjust your income that you're pulling out of the out of the company, not your owner draw, but your income, your W two, and yes, even if you're a corporation, you should be paying yourself a salary. 
reasonable salary. So that way, you know, if you ever wanted to qualify for a home loan or do mm-hmm. something else, you can, you can get, you can get business or you can get credit for yourself. But those three questions are so incredibly important. And, you know, it, it really does affect how profitable your business is. And when you can get comfortable not running your entire lifestyle through your business, then you'll start to see that your company is a lot more valuable than you ever thought. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's so th- that's one example. And, so th- and your accounting team is not going to give you that answer. They're not going to, you, you can't hate your accounting team for like, why didn't you tell me this? Right. Because they're not thinking that way. Yeah. They're yeah. thinking for taxes. Exactly. And I loved what you said when you first started with that, right? Which is most of the time they tell you what they saw and it doesn't help you at all with where you're going. They report the news is what I like to say. They, (laughs) they report the news and then they tell you what that actually means, but tax planning and, and really, uh, profit planning, like, you know, it's right in the name of your podcast profit with a plan, right? You can't just do this by accident. So those three items were, if these expenses don't produce revenue, retain a customer or retain revenue is that what you said if they don't if they don't um pro, uh, if they don't provide a client or produce a client right a customer okay. if they don't um retain a customer or right. if they don't increase the, the lifetime, lifetime value. value of your customer so that's the lifetime value of your customer is super important If you have a customer that walks in your door, opens your door, buys one product, walks away, and you never see them again, then the lifetime value of that customer was that sale. Right. If you can get the customer to walk back into the door a second time, a fifth time, a tenth time, then that's even better. If they buy more products from you, if they stay longer in a relationship with you, that's how you calculate the lifetime value of yeah. your customers, how long they plan to spend money with you. Yeah, I love that. I tell people all the time, lifetime value is the driver of growth. People get all caught up in what I call cost of acquisition. CAC, <laughs> Which is expensive. CAC, 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 as you might call it if you're in the software, cost of customer acquisition. You should know what that number is, but that's not where you make all your money. And if you think mm-hmm. that's where your money ma- money is made in your business, you're absolutely mistaken. Marcy, you just brought this up. So it just happens to be that uh, a couple hours ago, I had a phone call with um, the second longest customer at my digital marketing agency, Yoko Local. He's been with us since the agency started in 2011. Love He's it. been with us since 2012. And he, um, it, it, so your point is, it's, I think about the blessing of that. Now, I wish all of them have stayed since the day they started. That's not always the way it works out. But the no. point is, is it is a, it is a driver of value in the long run when you can continue to serve someone. And what you really don't under some people don't understand is that when a customer comes back over and over and over and over again, there's an extreme amount of trust that is mm-hmm. placed and that trust is built. That's what builds brands if you think about it. So I love that you brought that up. I love that. Well, it also provides you with a continuity of income, right? In your income stream. Sure. Um, the longer the person comes in, that becomes an annuity. Uh, if we use financial advising information, <laughs> um, that becomes a, a membership, a subscription that they continue to pay. Right. And those are, those are valuable customers when you look at getting financing or investments or loans or SBA or whatever you're going to do, when you've got more subscription style customers on your books, that means I can count on that number coming in every month and I don't have to worry about that. Then I can go out and get more clients the other way, but you're spot on with the client acquisition. Um, I have, I have many clients that I have in my book that actually look to spend the same amount that their first acquisition, or or if I flip that around, the acquisition cost is what their first purchase is, right? So if it costs me $1,000 to acquire the client and I get paid $1,000, I'm happy because I know the next month they're going to spend $1,000 with me. Yes, and the month yes. after that, they're going to spend $1,000 yes. with me. And so 
you know, that's, that's really the mastery and understanding those numbers, everything, even if you hate, we all hate. And by the way, when we were back talking about the accountants, Mm -hmm. do not do your own accounting, (laughs) do not do your own accounting, hire the professionals to do it for you, because that's not a, that's not an exercise the CEO of a company should be doing. And you can always get really good reports out of it. But understanding the information that comes back and what those numbers are telling you, that's where people like me come in to say, hey, this is what it means. This is the power of what it can do for you. And now let's leverage that and make you a whole lot more money. Yeah. Yeah. So I love the way you, we just broke that down. And, and, you know, I think that uh, the first time I heard a story and I really started to understand cost of acquisition, because when we talk with small to mid-sized business owners, they're operating from a different perspective. Maybe they're not venture funded. They're not publicly traded. They're operating out, they're bootstrapped, (laughs) operating out of cash flow, right? So sometimes Mm -hmm. when you tell them the story that, hey, it's going to cost us a thousand dollars to get the first thousand dollar purchase, they sometimes can't. They, they freak out. They, they can't think past it. Here, here's a funny conversation that just happened roughly a year ago. Really sharp entrepreneur crushing the game in his niche. And when I say crushing it, I don't know in 12 years if I've seen a company with 3,500 five-star reviews in Google, local business owner, murdering the game, killing the game. But here's what his inquiry was. Daryl, our cost of acquisition is $81. And I only make 70 on the sale. I think the paid media company is not doing a good job. I need to lower the cost of acquisition cost. And I said, okay, let's take a look at that. But my question went to what we were talking about. What is the lifetime value of this customer though? Are there cross and upsells? Let me, let me just say this. It turned out that it was $563 LTV as we could do some rough estimates. So it wasn't a high ticket service. And mind you, let me repeat, he's killing the game. He's crushing it. We go into his uh, audit, just like, you know, we're, we're both the same. Uh, we don't make recommendations. It, it, you know, pr- uh, prescription without diagnosis is malpractice, right? It's just <laughs> yeah. malpractice. People don't get it, but you, prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. And so I go into the thing and he, mind you, he came to my agency to run the paid media and lower his mm-hmm. CAC. Okay. And I said to him, I said, listen, your company, your agency is not doing a bad job. So your, your cost of acquisition Same. is right it's where it needs to be. <laughs> it's $11. Cost of, well, he wanted it to be $8. And I'm like, yeah, that's not, that's not reasonable. <laughs> but, but back to this idea that the idea of the, the thing I wanted to say, and I want to throw it back to you is I remember listening to a story, very big company. So mind you, it is a big company, not a smaller mid-sized company. And their cost of acquisition for a customer is $15,000 roughly to get a monthly subscriber at $700 a month on a software product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even after the first year, you haven't broke even, you're halfway into the second year before you even break even or almost all the way through the second year. And some would say, well, why would anyone do that? Well, obviously they were funded and and obviously publicly traded a lot more cash to burn, but they knew the value of a customer. They knew the value of their lifetime model. And so let let me throw it back to you and ask you, you know, I always know that when I'm talking to experts, they have a couple of tricks in their bag that are like their go-to, not tricks, but you almost know almost anytime you get in in a meeting, you're going to these three or four things. I think one of them was what you just described, right? Tell us one of those other ones. Okay. So, um, one of the biggest challenges with today's business owners and and oftentimes why they you know fire their marketing agency is because they haven't done the foundational work yet right they're out there going oh well um my claim to fame is i've been in business for 60 years or the company's been in business for 60 years yes yeah, so what uh we're the strongest the fastest the prettiest the the we're the smartest um, we arrive on time. Um, you know, these are all duh answers. Like we call them platitudes. Right. They're, 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 you're supposed to. You're supposed to arrive on time. You're supposed to provide good customer service, right? It's like <laughs> <laughs> we say, okay, right. you're so you're supposed to. What do you want? A cookie? <laughs> 
I know. Isn't that the baseline for your business? If you're not, well then, you know, Hey, so here's another one really quick, not to throw you off. What's the, what's the other one? We're licensed, bonded and insured. Yeah. Damn it. Aren't you supposed to be (laughs) right? Right. (laughs) Um, so these are, these are duh things. And it's so funny because, um, I just brought on a customer and I'm looking at their marketing and I'm going, okay, (laughs) we need to work on that. So, I'm a marketing geek by interest and marketing is part of growth. I don't execute on the marketing, but I help build the foundation so that my customers marketing efforts, the ads, the, the, the pieces and the angles that they use, the tactics that they use could be more impactful, but it all starts with understanding what separates you from everybody else, right? I can promise you, you are not the only chiropractor in Vegas, or you're not the only carpet cleaner, or you're not the only whatever doing your jam. There are many, many, many people competing with you out there. And so part of our work is really truly to figure out what is your position of market dominance? How do we separate you from the pack in a way that now we can state that you, like in my case, business owners come to me to double or triple their revenue without spending additional, that's the word, additional marketing or advertising. So understanding what you could separate yourself with by having a problem that your customer has that they don't want and being the solution that they're looking for that you haven't found, they haven't found yet. Mm -hmm. Then providing the most compelling offer that makes them think, oh my gosh, I have to take that. I have to try you, right? And the only way you can do that is to be able to get into your customer's head and find out what's keeping them up at night and being able to answer that in a way to prove that you are the most logical step to go with. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we're the fastest, best, strongest, been around the longest time kind of answer. It's all about them, not you. They could care less about you. They just want the result. Mm -hmm. And if you could provide that foundational work, or if you could do the foundational work and come up with a position of market dominance that provides that solution to your one client, doesn't mean you can't help 12 clients, but that one client, then you're going to have much stronger impact when you run your ad because that one client, their ears are going to perk up and go, what? She just was talking to me. And then they're like, okay, now let me look some more, right? Because the hardest thing to do is grab their attention. And if you can't address the problem, then you can't grab their attention because let's just say there's a few things coming at them every day on online and in the mail and on TV and radio and, you know, in their inbox and when they're reading something or what (laughs) bombarded by, by marketing. So how do you stand out? Yeah, exactly. That's probably the deepest one I've had in my bag, bag of tricks. What's happening today in this economy? Right now, we are in March of 2023. A little buzzword out there, a couple buzzwords right now, inflation, uh, coming off the buzz. We're we're in recession, so to speak, or heading towards, who knows? Sure, sure. Coming off a couple of things like supply chains. There's always something, right? But what's the sense? something. What's the sense and tone right now in your client's world? What can, seems to be concerning them the most and how are you addressing that? Well, good question. You know, fear is always a, a challenge, right? And in, in the small space that I work in, um, we'll call them Main Street, we'll call them micro-sized businesses, businesses trying to strive to that $5 million revenue mark, whatever, you know, they could be anything, everything. Um, the, one of the biggest challenges that we're all facing is labor, right? Um, if you're a one-man shop, you're not really a solid, you know, company yet. You're 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 providing, you're exchanging your time for money. Mm-hmm. So the number one leverage you can do is get other people trading their time for your money. 
And so finding people to do the job and help you grow the company is probably the biggest challenge right now they have. And it stems from um, a revolutionary situation going on in the, in the economy called, you know, the, the great resignation, right? People are all trying to get out on their own. They want to work in an environment that they feel good in. They want to be paid appropriately, but maybe pay or a full pay scale is not always what they're looking for. It might be flexibility in calendar. It may be flexibility in location. It may be, hey, I want to do project work or or process work or part of a, a team, you know. Mm-hmm. So they may be looking for other things above and beyond the, the basis of a salary. Um, today's business owners, they don't know how to deal with that. I mean, we just came off of COVID and they're the people I'm talking to, they're like, what do you mean they're not coming into the office? What do you mean they're working from home? Yeah, that's a great idea. You don't have to pay overhead. You can pay salary appropriately. You get more work done. You know, there's a lot of benefits to having someone work remotely. But business owners, unless you need to be at the cash register, front counter or assembly line, maybe it's an adjustment, right, on the business owner's side. And I think finding good talent at a price they can afford, right, and and doing it in a way is, is probably what's keeping most of my clients up at night right now is, uh, you know, I, I, I need people and I can't find yeah. them. Well, let's Hello. figure out a different way then. Yeah, I love that. I, I was on a uh, podcast yesterday and I I don't know if I didn't say it three times and I keep coming back to it because look, business only has eight things that happen, right? HR happens to be one of those things. That means people, <laughs> right? Near, people make your business. People are the thing, right? And it's uh, today it is definitely an interesting world. Um, what I'm seeing, and I don't know if you're seeing this with some of your your clients, but I'm seeing a lot of people apply, but then not follow through on their interests. I mean, I'm seeing people sort of raise their hand digitally. Of course, today it might be automated applying and things of that nature. But and but I'm also seeing, to your point of, they're not necessarily chasing the check. They're chasing the freedom, the flexibility, the, the thing. But I'm also seeing something else that's slightly disturbing for me. And that is, and I get it, it's okay seasonally if you're not you know, you chase what you want to chase and you've got to find the right fit. But I think what we think about in business sometimes is we're in the results business, right? The business is here for a purpose. It's here to serve the customer. It's here to deliver a product that provides or service that provides value. And it's here to provide value to the business owner, right? The equity stakeholders or the stakeholders, however you want to deem that. Mm -hmm. And what I've also, I've I've seen in the last couple of years, especially post-pandemic, sort of a lackadaisical drive in people to want to go the extra mile. It's like they want to stay in their lane. You know, you probably saw this a little while ago when when Elon Musk bought Twitter, <laughs> Twitter. And, open, uh, and openly <laughs> stated that. that thing up, didn't he? <laughs> I don't know. I don't use it. So, I mean, I'm on it, but I don't, I don't use it. Use it I, I don't know what he did, but but he did make a very interesting comment. Like, if you're not ready to work hard, you shouldn't work here. Now, I think that there's some extreme stuff going on there, but there are some people wired to do that and that's going to be attractive. Um, But to the point of, of results, when results matter and customers pay for those results, I just, there, is there a sense in your mind that in the finding of the talent, we're not just looking for people with the skill or the knowledge or the background or the years of experience. It's, it's sort of an intangible thing that we're, I'm, I'm missing in the market right now, which is that desire to, to win, to help the company win, to be committed to the task at hand. Uh, I see a little bit of excuse itis showing up in the world where, oh, I did the best I could. So if that don't work, I guess I'll just quit. And I'm like, I don't, <laughs> I'm like, where does this you coming know why from? That's, so, you know why I think that's happening? And this is just my, you know, um, armchair quarterback uh, concept of it, but I'm in circles and I talk, right? Talk a lot. I listen to. Um, but I think, I think really, truly what we have to do as business owners is we need to shift, right? Um, just like we shift for our customers, right? 
the customers drive the business, they better be. You know, we have to run our business the way the customer wants. Well, our customers are being served by our team. And so we need to really truly become the employer of choice for the desired team that we want. And again, it goes back to understanding what, you know, we know the goal, we need results. We need our widgets produced and sold to this ideal customer. But in order to motivate our team members, and I'm not an HR practitioner by any means, you know, I just, I I know too many things. But you've got it, what motivates them? What drives them? Mm -hmm. Is it the four day work week? Is it the occasional time to go watch Bobby play baseball? Is it the, I want, you know, I want to come in later in the day or work later at night? What is it that drives that employee to want to be part of your team? And, and it could be personality, you know, all those personality tests that you can align all the dots and say that they're going to perfectly replicate your best employee, (laughs) or, or it could be that they want something out of their life that they're looking for. And you as the employer of choice can dangle that carrot in front of their face to motivate them to do it. It's no longer the sharp burning stick behind them of our parents' generation where you work your butt off all day for a paycheck and the man, right? And you go to the, you go to the, 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 the plant and you work your butt off and you come home and then you have no life and go bowling, right? Whatever yeah. the Flintstones. Um, <laughs> but I just totally dated myself, but you know, the, the kids Yabba-dabba-doo. today, I know, right? The kids <laughs> today, the, the, the generation, the working economy today that has visions of things that they want to do and values and beliefs and opinions and and dreams of their own if we can curate that in a the perfect combination for that type of person you're going to get a lot more in a lot less time i think there was just a study done saying that you're getting more production out of your employees with an 8 hour 4 day work week than you were getting from an eight hour, five day work week. And they're happier, more content. They show up, they get this stuff done off and now they're got three days to do what they need for themselves. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, I think, I think we as business owners have to shift and become the employee of choice and provide an environment that they want to be part of. It's a good point. Great distinction. Uh, it is definitely an interesting environment. I, I uh, to kind of echo a study I saw on LinkedIn, and that is, again, post-pandemic, there are two and a half times as many people who want to work from home remotely or from anywhere than there are available opportunities. And I think the message that I still see out there is, again, I've never had a season. I've been, I've been an employer for 20-something years, 25-ish years I've never seen roles where I've got 200 applicants inside of a 24 hour to 40 hour window. Something is happening in the world right now. Either there it's just that demand curve where everyone wants to work from home, but there's not enough remote jobs available. So mm-hmm. something's going on out there. So it's very interesting. I, I we, we get ready to, 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 to land this plane. I want to ask you about uh, your upcoming book, share everyone, share with yes. you. You've written three books. Yeah. The third book. is Yeah. Coming yeah. Yeah. Second book is them. right here. Um, so funny, all my books have to do with profitability. Can you imagine? Right. Um, I so the I third... couldn't imagine. I don't know why you would go down that path three times, but no, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know because it all, it's, 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 it's all about the end result. Right. Yeah. Um, so my third book is called the profit booster and I'm super excited. It's actually in production, wrapping the cover right now. So within the next couple of weeks, I should have it up and launched and ready to go. And it's talking about probably some of the similar 12 strategies I have in my second book. Um, but it's, it's actually going to talk more about the pathway on how you get there. So it starts with 
people and process and how do you find more leads and yet how do you produce more conversions and it, and it just seems to have more of a logical process to it that okay. seems to produce the numbers that I've been getting with my clients and so um, it's a little bit more step by step by step rather than just a, a stack of theories and and strategies that I use my original book was so funny it was like okay you're either increasing revenue or you're cutting costs. So here's five ways to increase revenue. Here's five ways to cut costs, right? Got and then it. there's a balance. So, so I'm evolving as a writer as well, but um, yeah, it's, it's super exciting. Um, you know, it, it's, it's almost like a bug, right? Or a tattoo, right? You get one, now you're already thinking about what you're going to do with the next one. Right. Hmm. Um, and it starts to, it starts to e evolve, but the greatest thing it does for me is I don't make money on book sales. I make, it helps me elevate my expertise and yep. allows me to get on podcasts, speaking stages, talk to more people. Um, just, you know, when, when a customer, when, when a prospective client goes and, and learns about me, however they do, then they go into my social and my network and my place and start to troll me, right? It happens to every business. You're trying to validate if this is a real, the real deal and do they make sense? Well, I'm always posting on social. I have a blog that goes out every Sunday. I've got a, I've got a podcast that goes out every Tuesday. Um, I'm always talking about growing your revenue, driving your growth and preparing for some future sale. And a book just elevates that even more. So yeah. when a prospective client comes out and trolls me, they're like, oh, she's legit. Okay, let's have a conversation. Exactly. So it kind of brings down the barriers for me. And they're, they're, they're helpful. They're very helpful yeah. uh, tools to use. I, I, I'm talking to a lot of people these days with books. You keep validating and, and f <laughs> making me feel inferior because I don't have one. But oh, uh, on. that'll... That aside, I'll, I'll get you. to it. I'll I'll I'm, definitely gonna get, I'm definitely going to get to it. So, uh, Marcia, where can everyone find you? You've got numerous resources online from the podcast, your yes. main website, to uh, where are the best places for uh, people to find you? Well, you know, um, I'm going to do one. I'm going to do, do uh, how do I do this easy? Because, you know, if I, if I give you too many things, you won't, give, you won't do any of them. So I'm going to assume in the podcast notes, there's going to be a laundry list of all the places I'm at. Um, but I have um, my podcast, Profit With a Plan, is up on YouTube and, and the audio version. That's always a great place to learn ideas. Pushing close on episode 200, been doing it in my fourth year. Nice, amazing nice. guests. You were a guest on as well. Um, got lots of great stuff coming up. But I think the more exciting thing coming up that I'm doing right now, like just fresh off the press kind of thing is I've launched a new workshop and is it okay if I share the workshop? It's got some really good education in it. Um, and, um, I'd love to, I'd love to just get listeners to, to check it out. It's sure, about a 20, 25 minute commitment, um, but super valuable stuff. So it's over, it's called the 30 day profit booster, right? And my claim on this is outrageous, crazy, insane, like you've never heard a claim like this before. But I'm telling you, I can boost your profit, your net profit, by 45% in just 30 days. What? That's insane, mm -hmm. right? And so I put my money where my mouth is. I put it in a webinar. I'm telling you all about it. And I'd like you to go visit 30 Day profitbooster.com and go check out my free webinar. Awesome. I think that'll give you a taste of what I do. Yes. And we will get all of the resources where you can find Marcia linked up in the show notes. Uh, and you can find that over at my main website, which is darylevens.net. Uh, Marcia, it is such a pleasure to, first of all, I love that you're a results driven person. I know that's how, when we first got connected, it was kind of an equal vibe. You're willing to put your money where your mouth is. You're willing to say, I'm going to do this before you even give me money, which is to say, hey, I'm going to bring you value before we even get knee deep into this relationship, which is different in the world today. Some people are like, pay me and I will do. And you and I are both like, no, no, no. Let me help you prove that I know what I'm talking about. And then you're going to want to be all in with me. So uh, congratulations on the work you're doing. The work Thanks. that you're doing is also slightly different than a lot of coaches or consultants. 
when you start talking about legacy and when you start talking about turning the business into an asset, when you start talking about an exit for all of those years of hard work, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the 20 years, the, the missed kids games and all of the things I know exactly what that looks like, even though, you know, we try to find our way into balance into that and, and work life integration. Um, thank you for the journey because working with entrepreneurs, working with people like me, uh, who are a little, you know, we're visionaries, but at the same time, sometimes it's like herding cats, you know, <laughs> um, it takes a lot, it takes a lot of tenacity and strength for you to, to kind of keep us straight. So thank you for the work that you're doing. I want to ask this last question. And that is if today happened to be the last day you could serve entrepreneurs on this planet or really anyone no. in this walk of life. No, we don't want that to happen. It's not going to happen. But what would you want everyone to remember you for? You know, I believed I could. I tried really hard to do what I said. And I always kept going, right? You know, we business owners, there's bumps in the road. There's left turns when I should have made a right turn. There's ups and downs. There's fallen relationships, friendships, empty bank accounts, big full bank accounts, empty bank accounts again, you know, and um, she tried, she kept going because she believed that it was possible to have a successful business and it didn't have to be hard. I love it. I love it. Marcia Reiner, thank you for being on the Mindshift podcast. I look forward to our continued association. I know we have a project in the works uh, yeah. to help educate and inspire entrepreneurs going forward. So I'm really excited to continue our collaboration on that. And uh, I hope to have you again back on the show here in the near future. Daryl, from one podcast host to another, well done. And thank you very much for having me on. Glad to have you. Well, listeners, thank you so much for hanging out with us today on the show. If you want, again, the full show notes and description and all the links, head over to DarylEvans.net, click on the blog tab, and you will be able to find those show notes there. And if you've enjoyed today's show and you're not subscribed, hit the follow button wherever you're listening to the show. And if you believe you know an entrepreneur who could benefit from hearing the tips, the advice, the strategies that Marcia has shared today, do me a favor and share this show with them. It actually helps them. It's, it's really a form of volunteerism where you can bring something of value to them just for you spending time being with us today. Until next time, and if we haven't met, my name is Daryl Evans, and I'm your host. I'll see you next time. All right, listening audience, if you have enjoyed today's episode and we have never had a chance to meet, I'm Daryl Evans. I'm the founder and CEO of MindShift Coaching, the CEO of Yoko Local. And if there's anything we can do to help you, be sure to leave us a comment wherever you're listening to this, to this show. Be sure to follow, hit subscribe. And if this was inspiring to someone that you think could benefit from it, be sure to hit the share button and make sure they take a listen. We'll see you again on another episode of the MindShift Podcast. Take care. Hey, it's Daryl Evans. Hit the subscribe button so you can become a part of the MindShift community. We'll help you shift your mind so you can shift your results.